As you watch this review, please fill in your slotted notes. Reconstruction by definition meant to build something again, and it was the name given to the time period after the Civil War. Georgia and all of the other southern states that seceded and fought in the Confederacy needed to be rebuilt and brought back into the Union. Here you can see the rail lines outside of Atlanta that were completely torn up by Sherman's march and the other destruction in Atlanta from when Sherman burnt the city. Now Lincoln had a plan for rebuilding the South that was very simple. He wanted just one-tenth of the po people in each state to take an oath to obey the U.S. Constitution and then to set up a new government and to abolish slavery. Now the Confederate leaders and generals could not take this oath and since it's one-tenth of the people it was called the 10 percent plan. Again, Lincoln wanted to be really simple with this. He wanted it to be fair for the South, rebuild the country quickly, and just bring everything back together. But the radical Republicans felt it was just too lenient, too soft, and that the Southern states should be punished for their actions. Lincoln is assassinated, so his plan does not go into action. The Vice President, Andrew Johnson, takes over the presidency, and he's committed to carrying out Lincoln's plan, but he adds a few things. We'll talk about those in just a moment. In December of 1865, the ratification of the 13th Amendment freed all the slaves in the United States, and it banned slavery in the U.S. and any of its territories. Johnson said that once the amendment was passed, the southern states could come back into the Union. Here is the 13th Amendment. It was approved by Lincoln, but not ratified until December after he had already been assassinated. <clears throat> now, Johnson's plan did have a few other requirements, like I said, that were a little bit more harsh than Lincoln, but overall, he still kind of had the same mindset that Lincoln did of let's get this done, let's get the states back together. So then in 1868, the 14th Amendment is passed that made all former slave citizens of the United States, and it granted citizenship to all persons born in the United States, and it guaranteed equal rights under the law for citizens. At first, Tennessee was the only state to approve it, but Congress told the states that they must approve it to be readmitted to the Union. And the 14th Amendment was passed in response to the black codes that many of the southern states had created, including Georgia. Here is the original 14th Amendment. And then the 15th Amendment declared that no citizen of the United States should be denied the right to vote on account of race, color, or previous servitude. Now at this time, this only applies to males. Women's right to vote comes later. But now African Americans could vote and run for political office. The, and an image of the first vote in Freedmen Voting in New Orleans. Now, we've talked a great deal about the Freedmen's Bureau and what their purposes were to help feed, clothe, and provide medical care to former slaves. And it also established thousands of schools and helped them with their legal problems. Now, it, they did help many poor whites that had lost pretty much everything in the war, like people that had had their homes and farms burnt due to Sherman's march. Here is a picture of a Freedmen's Bureau agent standing between groups of whites and freedmen because it was a battle. Most Southern whites did not like the Freedmen's Bureau and what their purposes were, and they didn't see the need for taxpayer money paying to help these people, to help the freedmen. But it was necessary. They had come from a horrible system of slavery, and they needed a new life, and it was the responsibility of the federal government to help them with that. Now, Georgia had a higher population of freed slaves that were uneducated and unemployed than any other state because it was forbidden in Georgia prior to it was forbidden in Georgia prior to the Civil War to educate slaves. So the Freedmen's Bureau created the first public school program for blacks and whites in the state and set the stage for Georgia's modern public school system. It established universities like Clark Atlanta and Morehouse. Here is an image of a freedman's school. Many former slaves were forced to work 
return to the plantations that they had been slaves on to work because most plantation owners now are broke and they still have all this land that they want farmed and their slaves need jobs so that was the best place to go it was sort of what they knew and where they knew and it was difficult for them to move around the country with lack of money so and they knew how to grow crops and like i said the landowners still needed the labor in the sharecropping arrangement the owner would lend the worker a place to live their seeds and farm equipment and here you can see the sharecroppers picking cotton and their cotton bales. In Mississippi, some images of sharecroppers. And you notice the man with the gun kind of off to the right side of the photo. Looks still a lot like slavery, doesn't it? It was a difficult system because they were, even though they were free, they were still enslaved to that land because they would get in debt because remember our simulation they just didn't make any money they would go in debt further and further every year and so they had to just keep working that land so it was a system very similar to slavery some children of some sharecroppers in Arkansas so they would receive no pay not a salary not like today a farmer receives a salary if you work for a farm they would just get a small share of the crops. Now, because they had no money for rent, they would have to give their owner a share of the crops, plus extra for the cost of the rent and supplies. And again, they rarely made a profit, usually typically further and further into debt. Some other sharecropping images. Now, there would be evicted sharecroppers because they wouldn't keep up with there either the landowner would run out of money to help support the sharecroppers they couldn't even buy the seed to give to the sharecropper because as crop prices would fluctuate and go too far down even the crops that were would come in there wasn't enough money for even the landowner to pay for the supplies to give to the sharecropper so they could farm the land and so they would have to evict the sharecroppers now the other type of farming was tenant farming. Tenant, tenant farmers made similar arrangements with landowners, but unlike sharecroppers, remember they owned some of their own animals, equipment, and supplies, so they could receive more money from the harvest. Even after money was deducted for their rent, there was still very little left for the farmer. So it was very difficult for sharecroppers or tenant farmers to get ahead in life and become millionaires. That we will learn about an individual in our next unit, Alonzo Herndon, who was a sharecropper growing up and then became a millionaire. And we'll talk about how he was able to do that. Now, the right to vote. For a brief period during Reconstruction, freedmen were given more political rights than they had ever had. And they wouldn't see similar rights for a hundred years. Um, with their freed freedom, 32 black legislators were elected to the Georgia General Assembly. Among those delegates was Henry McNeil Turner. He was an educated minister who had served as the first black chaplain in the United States Army. And here you can see an image of some of these um, senators and representatives. And you see the graphic of the various legislators and senators and congressmen that were African American. Um, from 1870, 1870 to 1876. Now, Turner was born in 1834 to a family that had been free for at least two generations. So that's how he was able to get education. And he went to work for a law firm in South Carolina when he was 15, and they were the ones who got him the education. So he was, he comes from a different background. He was not a former slave. He received his preaching license and traveled throughout the South. And after the war is over, he helps organize the Republican Party in the state and was elected to the Constitutional Convention of 1867 to help write a new state constitution after the war and then to the Georgia House of Representatives. Here is an image of Turner. Now, in 1868, the Georgia legislature expelled their black legislators, saying that the Constitution denied the, them the right to hold political office. They could vote, but they couldn't hold political office until the 15th Amendment was passed later on. 
Turner spoke out against this policy, and he received many threats from the Ku Klux Klan. Other legislators were also threatened by the KKK, with over 25% of them being killed, beaten, or jailed during their term. The KKK was a started as a social organization for former Confederate soldiers, but then later became political and violent. So established as a social club, later becomes the terroristic group that we have discussed. They used violence to prevent African Americans from exercising their civil rights, particularly their voting rights. They dressed in white sheets and hooded masks and would terrorize blacks and any whites who tried to help them. Their acts of intimidation and violence and murder in hopes of establishing social control over African Americans and their white allies. They grew in Georgia and throughout the southern United States during and after Reconstruction. Their, their acts become, become the norm for several decades. Now, they do kind of fade out once the turn of the century around 1900, but they'll have a resurgence later on that we'll talk about in the next unit. I want to go back and talk just a moment about when McNeil Turner and one thing that he did. He went to the Constitutional Convention of 1867, and this is something that is not included here, but you do need to know. This Constitutional Convention that Turner served on was held in Milledgeville, Georgia, which was the state capital at the time. Now, Milledgeville did not like people, um, did not, was very segregated, did not have any hotels where Turner and the other um, members of the convention that were African American could stay. And so they were denied entry to the hotels there, but they were still members of the convention. And so since they couldn't stay there and the convention was going to last several days, the state government and the people at the time the members of the convention decided let's move the convention to Atlanta because Atlanta will let African Americans, there are hotels there that they can stay in and they can then still participate in the convention, the Constitutional Convention. And because of this movement of the Constitutional Convention, that moved the capital to Atlanta. So that because Atlanta at the time was seen as a more progressive city in the South than any of the other cities in the state of Georgia at the time. Okay, if you have any additional questions regarding this unit, remember we do have one more study session Friday morning. You're welcome to come in, ask any questions, review this slotted notes packet, review your reconstruction plans, review your amendment sheet, review the note sheet we took with all the arrows and boxes and ask questions if you have questions. Okay, test is Friday.